Hello to everybody and welcome to our today's webinar. We are pleased that quite a lot of listeners from the first webinars have joined us again. And a special welcome, of course, to all those of you who are new today. A difference to our previous webinars is that today's issue, we focus more on additive manufacturing and not so much on the MIM technology. Now, let me first briefly introduce our team to you. My name is Sibylle Hildner Lippold. My profession is translator and interpreter with focus on economics. I work with the company for more than 25 years now. And I'm part of the MIM sales team and mainly responsible for our international markets like Italy and France. Dr. Simone Schuster studied mechanical engineering at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. She did her PhD degree in the field of material science. Since four years, Simone is R&D engineer at MIM+. She's responsible for the additive manufacturing team and works on material development as well as sintering and process optimization. Dennis Marquardt started his professional career with a solid three years apprenticeship as a tool mechanic, specializing in stamping technology. Subsequently, he acquired a degree as certified technician. Among other things, he managed projects in the fields of automotive and mechanical engineering technology. In 2018, Dennis joined MIM Plus Technologies in the function of a technical sales manager and is today responsible for the sectors automotive, mechanical engineering, electronics and sensors. Now, before we start, here's some general information for you. I will first briefly introduce the company to you and then we'll go on with the lectures. Simone will start and we'll hand over to Dennis later on. During the presentation, all participants are muted, but please do use our chat functions for upcoming questions, because directly after the presentation, we will do a questions and answers round where Simone and Dennis will answer your questions. So now let's get started. MIM Plus Technologies is an experienced and innovative manufacturer of metal parts and assemblies. And our focus is on high-tech materials. We belong to the OBE Holding Corporation with production sites in Germany and China. The company has been founded in 1904. So today we look back at almost 120 years of experience in precision engineering. We have 500 employees in the world and a production floor capacity of 25,000 square meters. Now, some key facts on our company. We produce and deliver over 25 million parts and assemblies per year. Our customers come from such different industries like medical, aerospace, automotive or luxury. We have our own tool shop in-house and we have our own machine construction and automation. Our research and development department works with a very well-equipped laboratory and we work with a network of leading suppliers. As you can see, we are holding uh, uh, several certifications, among those the automotive certifications and a new one is the ISO 13485, which is the medical, medical certification. We have acquired this about one year ago. And we are proud to say that we are, have been one of the first companies to have acquired the EMAS certification, with, which is an environmental certifi certification. So the subject of our today's webinar is metal 3D printing in serial production. I'm handing over to Simona now. Enjoy the presentation. Warm welcome also from my side. Um, thank you, Sibylle, for the 
for the introduction. <coughs> um, in the next 30 minutes, I will going to explain you our two center-based AM technologies um, called Melfusion and Molchet and its capability for serial production. So let's start with an overview of different metal AM technologies and their characteristics. So basically, uh, metal AM technologies can be subdivided in beam-based methods, also known as direct methods, and cinder-based or indirect methods. Laser powder bed fusion is the most prominent example for beam-based methods. It's a well-established um, metal AM technology. The basic principle of the method is that a thin layer of a metal powder is locally melted by a laser. This is repeated layer by layer until the component is completely built up. Other beam-based methods are electron beam melting or direct energy deposition. So beam-based based methods are classified as a single stage process because the metal part is directly produced um, by the printing process. The high energy input and the high temperature gradients caused by the laser usually results in residual stresses. Also warping or um, distortion can occur. That is why support structures are necessary um, during the printing process in order to transfer the heat away from the part and to anchor the part on the build platform to prevent or minimize distortions. After printing, the support structures need to be removed mechanically. In general, any material that is weldable can be processed by these technologies. So broad material portfolio is already available, ranging from steels to um, aluminum alloys, uh, titanium alloys, super alloys, or copper. Productivity of these technologies is quite low due to the low um, scanning speed of the laser. So in general, beam-based um, technologies are limited to prototypes in small quantities. Now, what about the cinder-based methods? Um, in the past few years, a lot of different um, cinder-based AM technologies have been developed. Uh, the most popular one is binder jetting. Here, a liquid binder is locally jetted in a layer of um, metal powder, and the, the binder glues the metal particles together to create a so-called green part. There are two other um, relatively new and very promising uh, technologies, which we installed here at MEMPLAS. These are cold metal fusion and mold jet. Both technologies will be described in more detail later. So cinder-based technologies are classified as a two-stage process. First, the green part is printed, and then in the second step, uh, the binding and sintering process is followed to transfer the um, green part into a fully metallic part. During the heat treatment, um, uh, sintering distortion might occur depending on the part geometry, but there are actually tricks and, and ways to overcome these limitations. There's no need for support structures during printing, but supports might be helpful in terms of sintering. Despite their short existence, there are also are already a quite broad material prof portfolio available. And in theory, almost any material that is sinterable can be processed by these um, sinter-based technologies. In contrast to um, beam-based methods, sinter-based methods obtain a relatively high productivity. So here we can see a diagram from an Empower Insights report about sinter-based um, technologies showing the relation between quantity and part complexity. And beside conventional manufacturing technologies like milling, casting, or metal injection molding, um, typical quantities for laser powder bed fusion and binder jetting are shown as well. So laser powder bed fusion is um, applicable for medium to highly complex parts and for low quantities, whereas binder jetting is suitable for low quantities up to several 10,000 parts per year. So serial production is realistic. I also added our two cinder-based AM technologies called Metal Fusion is covering more or less the same region like binder jetting. It's also capable to produce uh, several 10,000 parts per year or even more. 
Moljet is a highly productive AM technology and several hundred thousand parts can be produced per year. So you see zero production of metal AM parts is possible with the right technologies. So the main reason for the higher productivity of sinter-based AM technologies over beam-based processes is that the energy input during sintering or during printing is much lower, um, which enables higher printing speeds. Also, the subsequent processes um, like the binding and sintering are designed for mass production. So the process chain of um, sinter-based AM technologies is actually very similar to, to metal injection molding, which you can see here in the upper right corner of the diagram. And um, MIM is a ma manufacturing technology for serial production and very high volumes can be produced. So first, let's have a closer look on, on the MIM process. So starting material is a compound of a metal powder and an organic binder. This metal powder and the binder are mixed to a homogeneous feedstock and then pelletized. The feedstock is then given into a conventional injection molding machine known for um, plastic injection molding. In the extruder, the feedstock is heated and plasticized and then injected into a mold uh, cavity under high pressure. Then we're getting a green part. This green part is actually 15 to 20% bigger as the final part, but it has already the, the final shape. This is due to the binder content or the binder that is still inside of the, the green part. So the binder was actually only used or needed for, for the shaping operation. So it, it, it has done its job. So in the subsequent processes um, and the, the binding uh, step, the, the binder is removed. So depending on the feedstock system that is used, uh, we can do this either in a solvent or a catalytical or thermal. So we usually do a combination of either solvent or catalytic with a thermal debinding. Then the brown parts are um, transferred into the sintering furnace where we do the, the sintering. So densification um, of the metal powder is happening and the parts are shrinking um, <clears throat> by 15 to 20%. And then we get a metal part that is almost 100% dense. If we now compare and the process chain of synthet-based AM, we see that it's more or less the same. Okay, there's no big difference. So we also have the starting material, which is a uh, metal powder and the binder. The shaping is of course different. Um, in this case, we're, we're printing the green part. And then we also have to go through a debinding and sintering in order to get a metallic part. Okay. So, now let's talk about our first um, cinder-based AM technology for today. It's called metal fusion. Um, CMF is um, a relatively new technology, but already quite mature. So here um, the feedstock is in form of a powder. So the metal powder is actually coated by the binder. It's spread in the build volume and then a laser is locally melting the binder. It's really important to point out that only the, the binder is melted, not the metal powder itself. So it, it stays solid. So the whole process is done at low temperatures with low energies. Um, we don't need any support structures during the printing process because the parts are embedded in the, in the feedstock powder and supported by the powder. So the clue is that we can use um, for this technology conventional SLS printers for plastic that are on the market for, for two or three decades already. And yeah, there's there's no new machinery that needs to be used here. Only the materials new. At MIM Plus, we're using a printer from XYZ Printing. It has a heated build volume. It's cubic with a length of 230 millimeter. The laser power is 30 watts. So you see there's not much energy required um, to print the green parts. We're printing with a layer thickness of 100 microns and the build speed is up to 20 millimeters uh, build height per, per hour. After printing, the green parts need to be depowdered. So we have to remove the loose feedstock that was surrounding our green parts. Um, 
the good thing is that we can completely recycle that excess material and just give it back to the to the printer. Thanks to the the high green strengths of the parts, um, we can do a fine cleaning with a water jet. This is very helpful um, in terms of hardly accessible areas like, for example, cooling channels. So we can really remove the powder even um, of um, cooling channels. <clears throat> the, the green parts are very robust. So we can also do uh, green part processing. So we can um, like mill the parts or cut the thread into th these green parts. Then the green parts undergo a solvent debinding to remove the base polymer. And then they're finally transferred into the sintering furnace where we do a thermal debinding and the sintering. So CMF parts obtain a uniform shrinkage of roughly 13%, which is quite low for cinder-based AM processes. OK. Here we have some, some design guidelines for, for CMF parts. And the wall thickness should be at least one millimeter to enable a robust depowdering. And they should not exceed 15 millimeters. We can print whole diameters starting from, from one millimeter upwards. And also unsupported overhangs are possible up to 10 millimeter. It's a bit dependent on, on the material. <coughs> also threads starting from M4 can be printed if they're aligned vertically, so in the C direction. Tolerances of plus minus 0.1 millimeter are possible, but they're strongly dependent on part geometry, its, its weight, and its size. OK, our second um, cinder-based AM technology for today is Moljet. It's also relatively new and quite unique. So how does it work? So actually, the, the printing process is a combination of two um, processes. So first, um, a thin layer of a mold um, is printed by an inkjet uh, printing process. And this mold or this layer is containing cavities with the cross section of your parts. And in the second step, a metal paste um, is applied by a slot die into that printed cavities. We don't need any support structures because we have the mold that is surrounding um, our parts and supporting them. And it's a quite efficient printing process because we can nest the parts and the distance from part to part is quite low. As you can see, the machine is uh, quite big. It's a big machine. <clears throat> it has six trays uh, uh, that can be printed simultaneously. So the trays are arranged on a carousel and they're moving from station to station. <clears throat> so we have six stations in the printer. First station is for the mold printing. We have the, these uh, four inkjet print heads inside of the machine and it's printing uh, a wax-like mold. Then the tray moves to the second station, to the material station. Here a slot that is moving over its surface and releasing um, the metal paste. And behind um, that slot die is a blade, which um, removes the excess material. Then we have station three and four, which are for drying. So there's a blower. So actually the, the feedstock is water-based feedstock, which has a consistency like honey. So we need to, to harden the green parts. And this is done by these drying processes. So there's actually warm air that is blown on, on the surface of our tray and the liquid ingredients of the paste are just evaporated and this leads to a hardening of our green parts. Station five is also for hardening. Here is a vacuum treatment which further hardens our green parts. And a sixth station is quite unique. Here we have an inspection station. So from every layer we're taking a picture but it's not just about documentation of the print shop. So if um, a defect layer is recognized, we can um, remove it in the material station and print it once again. So it's yeah, not just documenting your print shop, but we can also repair um, defect layers. 
tray size is quite big, 400 by 240 by 120 millimeters. So this big trace in combination with the sex tra trace that can be printed simultaneously gives us a high productivity of up to 1,600 uh, cubic centimeters per hour. The resolution of the inkjet printing process is quite high, 2,400 DPIs, DPIs, so we can print fine details. And the layer thickness can be varied between 40 to 200 microns. So after printing, we have a big wax block on our tray in which our green parts are embedded. <clears throat> so we need to do a de demolding process to, to receive our green parts. So this is usually done by a thermal process. So we just put the tray, put it into an oven, at roughly 100 degrees C for a couple of hours, and then we just melt the wax off. We usually do a fine cleaning in a solvent to really remove all paste residues. The green parts are also very robust and suitable for green part processing. And again, we have a uniform sintering shrinkage of roughly 13%. So that this is really compared to other cinder-based AM technologies like binder jetting, the, uh, very beneficial to have a uniform and low syndrome shrinkage, um, especially in, in, in terms of tolerances. I also would like to show you some design guidelines for, for mold jet parts. <clears throat> so wall thicknesses can be realized from 0.2 millimeters up to 15 millimeters. Hold diameters also can start from 0.2 millimeters what we can't do is we can't do uh, can't print um, closed hollow shapes like a uh, hollow sphere because the we, we need to get out the, the wax that is inside of that uh, sphere so that mold needs to be able to flow out otherwise we will have a problem in our cindering furnace threads starting from n3 can also be um, realized here in in the picture here you see an m4 thread which is really going quite nicely Tolerances of 1% or even lower can be realized, but again, it's strongly dependent on part geometry, um, size and weight. <coughs> Excuse me. So, okay, the printing itself is only half the battle. Um, sintering is also a very important step in the process chain because it's, it's essential to transform the green parts into fully metallic parts. So during sintering, a consolidation or densification of the porous structure is achieved in order to receive an almost 100% dense and fully metallic part. So the sintering temperature is close to the melting temperature, actually. So we need to consider creep due to gravity and also the friction due to the shrinkage of the part to avoid sintering distortion. So yeah, there's uh, know how uh, about sintering is necessary to get high quality parts. That is why I would like to show you some design guidelines for sintering. So a flat contact surface is always beneficial in terms of sintering distortion. If this is not possible, we have to think of other options. Um, one option might be to add a support structure here in the center, you see that part, that, that red uh, support leg is actually just there to, to support the balcony during sintering that will not deform. And in the end, we can remove it and then you have your final part. Another option is to incorporate reinforcement structures to your part to make it stiffer. And uh, so, yeah, if your part is stiffer, then, then the sintering distortion is um yeah almost um prevented another option is to to print a setter which is actually the negative of your uh, part which is supporting your part um during sintering but since these setters are uh, a single use product 
it's um, quite expensive and should be the last choice. Okay, so since MIM is a well-established manufacturing process and very similar to, to our two um, center-based AM technologies, I decided to kind of compare or benchmark um, CMF and Molchet to MIM. Um, so here we see a slide about the material portfolio that is currently available. In case of MIM, it's, since it's already established for a few decades, um, we have, of course, the, the largest material portfolio um, we have different stainless steels, low alloy steels, tool steels, super alloys, titanium, and copper. Um, we as MIM Plus have also some special materials um, available like neodymium and iron borne, which is not listed here. CMF already has uh, three material types available, two stainless steels, tool steels, a tool steel, and titanium grade 5 and uh, more um, materials are currently under development. It's quite similar for Molchet. Here we have uh, some stainless steels available, a lo low alloy steel, tool steels, and also titanium grade, grade five. And they're working on uh, super alloys and copper as well. So here's a comparison of the microstructure. In case of 36NL for all the three technologies, on the right hand side you see a typical MIM structure or microstructure. We see spherical grains and fine and very homogeneously distributed pores. So actually we see more or less the same for the other two technologies as well. Um, the only difference is that we, in case of um, cold metal fusion here and there, are some bigger pores which comes from the printing process and can be closed during the sintering process. If you need a completely dense um, microstructure, we have to do an additional hip treatment, similar as for laser powder bed fusion. But what we can't see, and what, what it was good is we can't see uh, the layer structure anymore after sintering. So, um, also, the mechanical properties are similar between CMF, Molchet, and MIM. The last slide of my part of the presentation is actually kind of a fact sheet that summarizes um, a little bit the, the capabilities or the characteristics of the three technologies. <clears throat> regarding part size, um, CMF parts start from one or two centimeters up to 20 centimeters. Of course, bigger parts are also possible, but in our case, um, our build volume is restricted to 20 centimeters. In Molchet, we can also print very tiny parts uh, starting from two millimeters up to very big parts of 30 centimeters. In MIM, we can also print uh, tiny parts. Um, with a few millimeters, and uh, maximum part size is limited at roughly 10 centimeters. The minimum wall thickness for CMF parts should be um, one millimeter. I already mentioned it, it's um, necessary for, for depowdering. <clears throat> Mulchet parts can have a wall thickness of 0.2 millimeter, um, MIM as well. So the surface quality um, of CMF is quite rough. Um, here we have an AR value of 15 to 20 microns. Um, Molchet <coughs> obtains a quite good surface quality for AM parts with an AR value of 5 to 7 microns. And MIM, <coughs> of course, has the best surface quality of 1 or 2 microns. The density for all of the three technologies is higher than 69% of the theoretical density. Um, typically, we reach even higher um, densities of 98 or 99%. It's a bit dependent on the material. Um, now, what about part complexity? Um, MIM is able to already produce very high complex parts, <clears throat> but um, 
since we have no no tool restrictions in additive manufacturing technologies, the parts in CMF and Molchet are even yeah better in terms of compl part complexity. And the lead time for additive manufactured parts um, is shorter, of course, because we don't need to produce a tool. So typically we have a lead time of three to four weeks <clears throat> for CMF as well as for mulchet parts and MIM is a bit longer. Okay, so I'm done with my part of the presentation and I'm now handing over to Dennis who will show you some business cases. Thank you, Simone, and welcome to all participants around the world. In fact, the audience today is coming from all over the world. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. In my part, I will present different business cases of products we already have in production, or we are close before printed with the cold metal fusion technology or mold jet technology. Uh, one hint in advance in my business cases, I will mainly exclude information about the binding and cinching process, for example, the capacity, due to the fact that as a metal injection molding manufacturer, the capacity for the binding and cintering process exceeds always the capacity of the printing operation. Uh, please feel free to write any questions afterwards. Uh, one more comment to this point, all materials we print, we have also running in MIM production frequently. So it's also possible to attach smaller batches to the binding or Sinter MIM series production, what enables us to give you the best possible price. So first business case I will show you are two parts, left and right which are used as a fixation for metal processing application. The background of the request was that the existing stamping and bending tools uh, were out of uh, lifetime. And so it was necessary to build new stamping or bending tools, what would expensive. So the demand was one time demand, two times 1,500 pieces. So in total, 3,000 pieces. The tolerances, smaller 0.1 millimeter, the material 1.4404, or maybe you know it uh, under the name 316, and the dimensions 24 by 20 by 9. We realized the production with the cold metal fusion technology, where it was possible to print 1,200 pieces in one print shop. Initial, of course, uh, this is our philosophy. We printed a few samples that the customer could test the function of the part. The lead time to get the cinder parts was approximately two weeks. And the cost savings uh, compared with building new stamping or bending tools, the customer saved approximately 30,000 uh, 30, euro. So in my second business case, I will show you a tool holder for different turning applications uh, where our customer developed a cooling channel design to increase massively the lifetime of the cutting inserts. 24 different versions in six sizes and up to three cooling channels uh, could be realized. On the right side, you see one example of a cooling channel where the cutting insert is cooled directly, the width of the channel is only 0.6 millimeters. The material is M2, it's a tool steel, the dimensions up to 138 millimeter by 22 by 22 millimeter. So the, it was the, the requirement was high flexibility and short lead times of two weeks. The capacity per print shop 72 pieces per print job and the process steps after sintering is milling, coating and laser marking. The cost savings uh, through this innovative cooling channels which are not realizable with classical manufacturing processes, the final user increases the lifetime of the cutting inserts up to 185%. The third uh, 
business case I show you, the background was that there were more and more inquiries from industries regarding a haptic lightweight uh, control button made of out of real metal. So real metal, I mean, you know, in the car, the coated, chrome coated plastic buttons. So the, the um, requirement or the inquiries were more and more to get a real metal. Also, there was the wish that the control buttons are personalizable and customizable and out of different materials as stainless steel or titanium. In my example, you see a control button with the dimensions diameter 20 millimeter and the height of seven millimeter. The upper version in gray was the first draft of one of our customer where we developed further to get the lightweight control button you see below in, let's say blue. We realized the production with the mold jet technology with the material stainless steel 316L and titanium. The capacity per print shop are 13,440 pieces. The cost savings here shown in weight reduction from the original closed version to our development developed lightweight version was 51%. And of course, realizing this variety of different sizes um, with classical manufacturing processes would not be economically reasonable due to the high tool costs. So in my fourth business case, the customer needs few thousand pins per year with the number one you see on the right side. At the visual front view, the surface has a radius and the cosmetic surface is required. The material is stainless steel 1.4404 and to fix the pin, two threads M4, 14 millimeter long are required. The dimensions of the pin are 25.5 by 16.5 by 15.5 millimeters. The production we realized with the mold jet technology. Capacity per print shop are 8,000 pieces. A functional thread without rework was built up. The pins are vibratory grinded and sandblasted. Finally, we reach a surface quality of RA smaller one micron. Cost savings uh, through toolless production and integrated threads, there is a significant cost advantage. Furthermore, the adjustment of the thread geometry could be realized without adaption of the tool. So the fifth and the last business case shows the advantage of 3D printing in terms of high complexity. The parts you see on the right side for the locking system industry are really small with the dimensions of four by 2.5 by five millimeter and with a high complexity and high complex inner shape, which would require a cost intensive complex tool with complex sliders. The requested quantities are 2000 pieces per year and per part. The material is 1.4404, 316L. These two parts we realized with our mold jet technology and the capacity per print shop for the upper part you see is 400,000 pieces. The capacity per print shop for the lower part is 275,000 pieces. The lead time for both parts only six weeks. The cost savings to, due to the complex internal form, the MIM injection tool would be, have been really expensive and limited only to two cavities. Thank you for listening and we are happy to answer your questions now. Yes. Hello um, again from my side, as we have um, announced uh, before, we are doing now a little Q&A round and questions and answers round uh, where we can like answer some of the questions which you have like put into the chat. 
So, um, Dennis, I'm sorry, no time for relax to, for you because mm -hmm. there is a question regarding um, your part, which uh, somebody wants to know if we can also produce really small quantities, for example, a quantity of two or three pieces per component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, it's possible to produce only two or three parts. Um, but as I showed you in my examples, the technologies are more designed for higher quantities. So let me say more than 100 pieces. Um, and so I think the technologies are more for serial business as I showed in, in my examples. But of course, if you if there is a bigger series behind, as I said before, the philosophy is to print only two or three pieces to check the design and uh, to see if the, if it's a stable process. But um, let me say the strategy or the what 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 you want to do, let me say is uh, to make a serious business to make uh, serious. Okay, great. I think there's another question also for you, Dennis, because somebody wants to know uh, regarding the different products you showed in your mm -hmm. cases uh, and wants to know how you decide which technology you take for which part. Mm -hmm. Oh, it depends really on the on the requirements. So it depends on the size of the part, of the surface quality. It depends if the material is available. Sometimes it depends, or often it's the case that uh, both technologies are possible to produce the part. And then it's sometimes the thing of, okay, when we have the next uh, printing run, so if it's possible to produce with both, we decide what is faster, but it depends really on the requirements. Okay. Uh, then there's some a material question. I think that's a good one for Simone, which somebody wants to know if we, you can also print aluminum parts. <clears throat> okay, so uh, no, we can't print aluminum. Aluminum is actually very uh, challenging regarding sintering because of the oxide layer on the metal powder and its low melting point. So I know that um, some researchers are working on this, but it's definitely not a standard material for cinder-based processes. And I actually don't know any MIM company that is manufacturing aluminum MIM parts. And another fact is that aluminum is quite easy to process with other technologies like um, milling, turning, or casting. So if you need um, a lightweight uh, material for your application, we can offer titanium as an alternative to aluminum. Okay, um, let's stick with the materials because there are just coming up uh, some more questions regarding materials into the chat. For example, uh, is it is the other two 3D printing technologies uh, possible for NDFEB and are hard metals possible? Um, I think <laughs> that's also a question for me. Um, <clears throat> so right now we, we don't have these materi materials available, but uh, in, in theory they, they should be also possible with these technologies. But in terms of NDFEB, uh, it's hard to, to get them um, anisotropic magnets because it's, we don't have, uh, uh, have a possibility to magnetize the, the green parts during the printing process itself. And um, hard metals are, should also be possible because they're usually they're cindered as well. Um, but right now we don't have a feedstock for these materials. But if you're interested in um, these materials, then just um, send us an email after after the the uh, webinar, and we will come back to you. Yeah, and then I think this is a typical question for sales because um, uh, Dennis. Um, one of our listeners would like to know if you can say something about the price level of the component compared like to other 3D printing technologies. Yeah, we made in the last years, we, we made the experience um, that our technologies 
are highly competitive if you speak about producing um, yeah more than one two three parts so if it goes to a small series uh, our experience is that we are highly competitive uh, on the market okay um yeah i have another question that's again for simone i'd say because it's regarding the type of production type uh which type of production type does have the less residual stresses in the final product um uh, residual stresses are not very common in in cinder based um technologies anyway because um we're we're cindering uh, the parts and then they're cooled uh, quite slowly so in the end, we have a normalized microstructure and uh, the, uh, the parts don't really obtain any residual stresses. Great. Um, I think that's uh, all I can see from the chat now. But um, I, have, uh, I had two questions which I wanted to inform you about anyway, because well, first of all, thanks for your interest, of course, and for your good questions. And uh, regarding like sharing the presentation, that was like two listeners wanted to know uh, if or how or where they can see the presentation uh, later on. So um, uh, you can like um, watch this webinar as well as also our previous webinars. You can stream them from our homepage or you can watch the, the YouTube video. Um, so, but in case you have questions like now uh, in addition, um, or if you want to get more details about our technologies or the way we work, or if you want to give a general feedback to the webinar, you can send your questions and comments to infomim at mimplus.de, as you can see also here. So um, our webinar format will definitely be continued and we are looking forward to welcome you also on the next issue. You will be informed in due time as soon as we have a fixed date and have a nice time until then and goodbye from our side. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.